An alliance that has endured for 70 years is showing signs of a rift. Saudi Arabia is so unhappy with the United States that it gave up a coveted seat on the UN Security Council just to send US a message. Why are the two allies at odds? And how bad are their differences? And what are the implications for the region? Find out next on The Line. This is On The Line and I'm Aisha Tanzeem. Saudi Arabia's chief of intelligence, Prince Bandar bin Sultan, recently told European diplomats that Washington's policies may force the kingdom to shift away from the U.S. Former Saudi ambassador to the U.S., Prince Turki El Faisal, lambasted President Barack Obama at a conference in Washington, D.C. Let's find out from our guests what this means for the two allies and their long-standing relationship. Joining me in the studio is Ellen Leipson, president of the Stimson Center. And also with me in the studios is Dr. Michael Ryan, author of Decoding Al-Qaeda's Strategy, The Deep Battle Against America. Welcome to On the Line. The list seems long at this point, Ms. Leipson, but let me ask you, what are some of the biggest sources of tension right now? Well, I think the Saudis, like everyone else, sees a shift in the power in the international system. While they've been heavily dependent on the United States as their security provider and partner in international economics and regional stability for many decades, they now see that the United States isn't either willing or able to be the sole superpower in every circumstance, that there are some regional conflicts like the civil war in Syria that the United States is somewhat standing back from. For the Saudis right now, I think the biggest issue is Iran, but they also are impatient or upset with us over Syria, the, the hardy perennial Palestine, uh, and probably Egypt we could add to the list of things that where, you know, there is sometimes a, a big picture alignment but a tactical disagreement. Uh, Dr. Ryan, is Saudi Arabia so upset with U.S. because the U.S. is changing its policy? Or, as some say, it's upset because the U.S. is not listening to them and not taking them on board before it makes the change? Well, I think these, these aren't mutually exclusive. I mean, I think that, that the Saudis are upset with us because, indeed, we're not listening to them uh, in, uh, the way they would like to be listened to. But also, I think their expectations uh, of us... Uh, weren't met, uh, especially with Syria. Uh, and underneath it all, I think, is a, is a, a, a gnawing anxiety that if we can um, sort of throw over, in their view, a long-term ally like Mubarak, uh, well, then what does that mean for them in the long term? Now, I want to read out some excerpts uh, from what Prince Turki El Faisal said in Washington, D.C. Uh, at a conference. I was particularly surprised at the harsh language. I want to understand the significance. So on Iran, he said, I also heartily agreed with those in the international community who possess the blessed wisdom to know that unilateral military strikes could be catastrophic. Alas, with Netanyahu observing Mr. Obama's lamentable conduct in Syria, he may opt for a unilateral strike in spite of the dire consequences. Uh, let me read out one more thing. On Syria, he says, the current charade of international control over Bashar's chemical arsenal would be funny if it were not so blatantly perfidious and designed not only to give Mr. Obama an opportunity to back down, but also to help Assad to butcher his people. How unusual is that? He's standing in Washington, D.C., pointing at the president and using these words. Well, I think Prince Turkey, first of all, is no longer in an official position. Uh, he has always been a very articulate and passionate spokesman for the Saudi perspective. Uh, and I, I, I don't consider it to be absolutely unprecedented for him to use a pointed uh, statement to get our attention and to make sure we understand the depth of Saudi feeling. But I think you've, you know, there's two different issues there. One is about the use of military force, um, you know, and the other is their single focus in the case of Syria on getting rid of Bashar al-Assad without necessarily coordinating with us or indicating what would come after. So while they are condemning the chemical weapons agreement as not sufficiently focused on getting rid of Bashar al-Assad, 
um, I think they show a little bit their naivete by not being able to understand that there's multiple interests in play here and that reducing Assad's uh, WMD capabilities is, in fact, a, a positive step for the international community. Uh, Dr. Ryan, let me, since she started talking about Syria, let me pick up on that thread. What would Saudi Arabia like U.S. to do uh, if U.S. doesn't agree to go for a military strike? They've also complained that the U.S. is not giving weapons to the Saudi opposition as they, pl uh, as they promised to do. The Syrian opposition. Uh, the Syrian opposition, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I think that, that uh, they would like us to be uh, involved uh, militarily and in terms of logistics, in terms of weapons, and in, in every sense. I, I think they would pre vastly prefer that we uh, put our thumb on that scale, the military political scale, uh, to hasten Assad's uh, uh, demise. Um, their perception that that's not what we intend to do, I think, is, is a tremendous disappointment to them. Uh, and I think hence the, the, uh, the, the very strong language uh, of, uh, of Prince Turkey. Um, who, um, as Alan mentioned, uh, emphasized that he was not speaking for the Saudi government, but he gives them a chance to, to really get this out in the air with, with the ability to have some space uh, for the official views. Uh, Ms. Lightson, Secretary of State Kerry was recently in Riyadh. What do you think he achieved there? Was he able to iron out some of the differences, or did both sides just listen to each other and not move forward much? Yeah. Well, first of all, on the question of listening, I mean, I actually think we do listen quite carefully and we understand that the uh, concerns of our Gulf allies are part of our security responsibility and our security posture in the region. We may listen and still not always agree, so that's a, a different matter. I think that uh, Secretary Kerry takes quite seriously the need to reassure their, our close partners in the region of our intentions vis-a-vis -vis Iran, for example, of our, you know, where we're, how far are we willing to go uh, to resolve our differences with Iran over the nuclear file, and what would that mean for, the, for Saudi Arabia and for uh, the UAE and for Israel, other uh, regional partners of the United States. So I do think Secretary Kerry cares a lot about um, maintaining personal relationships and reassuring our allies that we are in fact taking their interests into account. Did, did you feel that the Saudis felt reassured enough? Well, I think visit? this is an iterative process. It doesn't, one visit doesn't uh, resolve all of the uncertainties. I think the Saudis do have some strategic worry about the decline of American power, resources, uh, and ambition, if, if you will, uh, to be the, the regional problem solver. And so I think uh, the Saudis are not unique in that regard. So I do think there's, this is not something that can be resolved in one visit. I think that these, these visits are kind of tactical pieces, but there is a strategic trend line here. Dr. Ryan, worried enough, the Saudis are worried enough that they might be looking at other alliances, arrival of the U.S. perhaps? I'm really a doubter when it comes to them looking for other alliances. I don't mean to say that they won't uh, uh, do certain things that are of more than symbolic value, uh, for instance, an arms deal with, with, with uh, Russia or some further move uh, that tries to engage the Chinese. But I think they know, and I think this is part of their frustration, that really the United States is, is still the answer. I mean, this is not the first time uh, we've heard talk of the United States uh, losing uh, some measure of its power. But what really goes, is going on now, uh, from my view, is, is uh, the sense that we are the pivot, the long-awaited pivot uh, farther east uh, is somehow inevitable and there's only a matter of time and for the Saudis that, that should be very worrisome. Could it be that Saudi Arabia may also shift its policy towards not one big partner like the U.S. but having different partners for different issues? China and Russia seem to be closer to the Saudi position. Um, in uh, Egypt, for example, or Russia is very much in favor of the Egyptian military. In Syria, for example, they're very much in favor of keeping Bashar al-Assad there. So do you think Saudi Arabia could be relying on them for certain issues? Well, if we take the Syria case, the Saudis should be more angry at Russia and China than at us. On Syria, our actual interests are more aligned in the long run then certainly China and Russia have a position on Syria that should be completely unacceptable to the Saudis. I think that we have to think of this in, in very broad terms, that uh, 
Saudi foreign policy will, over time, gravitate towards the countries with whom it has the deepest economic interdependence, and, and so that the Saudis are also shifting to Asia. It's not just that the United States is shifting to Asia, it's that the Saudis see their own economic interests and stability and trade patterns, et cetera, shifting a bit more to Asia. The West will still be an, a very important piece of the pie, but Asia becomes a relatively larger piece for them. So, um, I, but I quite agree with Dr. Ryan that in the in, for as long as we can imagine, out 20 to 30 years, the United States will still represent very unique capabilities in the security arena and that the Saudis would be, it would be short-sighted on their part to try to switch too quickly to a different security provider. I think that's just not realistic. On the other hand, they will diversify their trading and economic relations and including some arms sales from other countries. I want to explore that and also touch on the Middle East Israel-Palestinian issue, but we need to take a short break here. We'll be right back. Voice of America, 1,500 hours of news and information, educational and cultural programming to more than 134 million people worldwide each week. Listen to us on radio. Watch us on television. Follow us on Facebook or Twitter. And through your mobile device. VOA. We're dynamic and consistent. In bringing you the most reliable information in 43 languages. Tune in. Tune in. Tune in. Welcome back to On the Line. I'm Aisha Tanseem. We are talking about the causes and implications of recent tension between longtime allies, U.S. and Saudi Arabia. Our guests are Ellen Leibson, president of the Simpson Center, and Dr. Michael Ryan, author of Decoding Al-Qaeda's Strategy, The Deep Battle Against America. Saudi Arabia also complains that the U.S. has not put enough pressure on Israel, that the settlements are expanding. That's not a new problem, though. Do you think, Dr. Ryan, they, they just threw that in there just to make the pile a little higher? I think that's, what, I think that's the answer. Uh, I don't think they expect us uh, to do uh, miracles with, with Israel on their behalf. And, and some people have noticed that in a, in a very strange way, <clears throat> which should be surprising, uh, the policy towards Iran uh, between Israel and Saudi Arabia is hardly different. Um, so, no, I don't think, I don't think the issue of uh, Palestine is always a heart issue to all uh, Arab uh, people, and so they, they're always going to emphasize it, but I don't think they expect us to do more than we're doing in that regard, uh, although they would wish that we would. Ms. Leifson, uh, right now, Saudi Arabia's bigger fear is that Iran will develop a nuclear weapon and hoodwink the West, or is it a bigger fear that the West will actually start getting along with Iran and they might be sidelined in the region? Well, I think it depends which Saudi you talk to. I, I think that almost any outcome of the current negotiations with uh, Iran has downsides for Saudi Arabia. If the talks fail and we return to an escalatory conversation about whether Israel or the U.S. or both will have to take military action. Uh, I believe that's bad for Saudi Arabia. Some Saudis, I believe, think they could you know, achieve some short-term relief, but in the long run that cannot possibly be good for Saudi Arabia. Um, if there's a rapprochement between the United States and Iran, I think the Saudis have a great fear that the United States sees Iran as the great strategic prize in the region and that their preeminence in American foreign policy would, would be adversely affected. In the long run, Saudi Arabia and Iran have to figure out how to get along. They're both sort of mini superpowers in the region, um, and that is something that the United States has only limited ability to shape and direct. So while the Saudis turn to us and push us on Iran, their position on Iran is not always internally consistent. Almost anything we do, they find fault with. In the long run, the Saudis and Iran have to figure out what their respective leadership roles in the region will be. Uh, Dr. Ryan, do you think Saudi Arabia is overreacting on some of these issues, or do you think they have genuine concerns that the U.S. may or may not be getting? Uh, well, I, I think they have genuine concerns uh, about U.S. policy. Uh, <clears throat> whether they're overreacting or not, I think that they, are, they wanted to make a very strong statement, and so uh, I don't think it was an accident that Prince Turkey you know, said the things that he said. I think they don't want to have uh, uh, and don't intend to have a, a, a real break. 
Uh, <clears throat> but it, it is, uh, you know, it's a very difficult situation. Uh, I, I think Ms. Leibson put it very well that, that essentially uh, there are downsides uh, almost uh, of any solution that we get to the, to the issue with, with Iran uh, or Syria for Saudi Arabia. Um, but on the other hand, uh, a, a, a real agreement that has uh, some meaning to everybody with Iran would be no doubt the best thing for Saudi Arabia in the, in the long run. I think with the real fear, because I hear from so many experts, you can hear this uh, in conferences, that uh, people uh, realize that there are any number of countries in the world that are all but a nuclear weapon. They get to a certain point where they could uh, put together a nuclear weapon in a short period of time. And the worry would be that we are willing, regardless of what we say, to tolerate that. And I think that's also the, uh, the problem that, that Israel has, that we're willing that, that brinksmanship, you just move it forward. But without putting pressure on Israel, Ms. Leibson, um, this pressure on Iran and the, by the Saudi Arabians and the Americans, do you think that makes American foreign policy a little inconsistent as Iranians complain? Well, I think that our policy has been to use coercive diplomacy. Diplomacy, we're willing to talk and see what your interests are, and the coercion part is the imposition of sanctions, which I think the Saudis have generally supported, although they thought sanctions at various moments weren't tough enough uh, and wanted us to go farther. But Iranians have complained that uh, Israel's nuclear weapons are tolerated, uh, and rather the, than yeah. pushing for a nuclear-free zone. Yeah. Well, you know, we nominally support this international idea of a Middle East free of all weapons of mass destruction, and I hope everyone would think that the destruction of Syria's chemical weapons is, in fact, a step in that direction. There was a big meeting in Geneva bringing together all of the experts of the countries of the region to talk about uh, how to move forward. And, uh, you know, the international effort is actually reconvening uh, this week in Helsinki. So there is movement in that direction. I think we are a long way away from Israel's nuclear program being on the table for negotiation. But in theory, the Israeli government position is that when it has normal political relations with its neighbors, that would be a topic they would be willing to discuss. And, and the U.S., uh, Dr. Ryan, the U.S. accepts it because Israel is such a close ally, or they feel like Israel is not going to listen to them anyway, so why push this? Uh, it's not diplomatically important for them. Because the w wider world looks at this, and they see an inconsistency here. Well, I mean, there, there obviously is an inconsistency, and it's an inconsistency that the world has grown used to, and I think that we should expect to, to continue, uh, because uh, domestically, politically, um, while there's not much conversation about Israeli nuclear weapons, uh, there's a tremendous amount of support for Israel within the American public, the voting public, and uh, that's not going away, and it's not going to change. Uh, so Israel has, uh, has always had a policy that says we won't be the first ones to introduce, uh, you know, uh, nuclear weapons. And what they mean by that is to use them. Uh, and I think the, the, that the, the sense is that the American government, any American government, really doesn't have um, much uh, leeway on this issue, not because of lobbyists and not because of all the things, but simply because the vast amount of American people think that Israel can be trusted. And interestingly, Saudi Arabia seems to have less problem with Israel having nukes than with Iran. Iran seems to be a bigger threat for them. Let me ask you this. What kind of um, implications is this tension having in the region with Syria going through what it's going, and Egypt going through what it's going. Uh, some people are saying when the U.S. tried to block the aid to Egyptian military, the Saudis were giving them money. Do you see any downside to this tension in the region? Oh, I think this is a moment of terrible turbulence in the region where the, all of the major Arab countries feel that their own uh, you know, foreign policy with both their neighbors and with the outside actors are in flux that nobody is feeling that the situation is stable or that they know what the regional order is supposed to look like. So I think it's a period of terrible turbulence. In some ways, Egypt is, is a relatively small piece of the, of the problem. Dr. Ryan, how long do you think these tensions are going to continue? These two countries, U.S. and Saudi Arabia, have been together for over 70 years now. They've been very close allies. Is, do you see this as going away in maybe a couple of years, or do you think this might be a major policy shift in both countries? Well, I think, it, I think it's, it's not 
a permanent position. I mean, I think that it's, it's, uh, it's localized over several issues that we've been talking about. And uh, how soon uh, we get back to a more cheerful relationship kind of depends on how issues uh, come out. If, uh, if the Saudis can convince themselves, if indeed uh, we achieve an agreement, as I hope we do with Iran, that's meaningful, uh, and, the, and the Saudis perceive that, um, that, that will go a long way. We still have Syria, and I, I think we will, we, will, we will still have a problem with that. Uh, Egypt is an, another issue, and, and while it may not be the major issue between Saudi Arabia and the United States, it's, it's an important one. And to the extent that, uh, I mean, Egyptians have just declared an end to the emergency, uh, state of emergency, and the and the uh, curfews, and, and if they move towards elections, uh, while we may not be totally happy, we, we, we will probably try to normalize more of our relations with Egypt. So there'll be less, less tension, but there'll still be the problem of Syria that I think will remain. And with Syria, the U.S. seems to be moving away, even though they asked for Bashar al-Assad to step down, they seem to be moving away from actively doing anything about it. Do you think the Saudis will eventually have to just accept that? or? How do you see it moving? Well, first of all, I don't think we've moved away. I think that the whole uh, diplomacy to get back to the Geneva process right. does have implicit in it that Syria, by the end of that process, there would be a new government in Syria. Now, so we haven't been blazing that from the rooftops because it requires buy-in from the current Syrian government and their friends, Russia and Iran in particular. So I do think that in the long run, uh, America's interests and Saudi interests are actually aligned, but we have these tactical, the, Soviet, the, the Saudis, I think, have a very different timeline than we do. They would like to see much quicker action to disrupt the regime um, and to bring about its fall. So they are, you know, passionately in favor of arming the rebels, but I don't think it's clear that the Saudis, first of all, alone can do it or are even very effective at whatever it is they are doing for, this, uh, for the Syrian opposition right now. They still want to use the U.S. military to achieve their national goals, and I think the U.S. has every right to step back and say maybe there's a better way to do this. Well, thank you very much. Before I say goodbye, I must thank our guests, Ellen Leipson of the Stimson Center and Dr. Michael Ryan of the Middle East Institute. And thank you for joining us. Please send us your questions or comments or watch our past shows on our website, voanews.com slash on the line. We look forward to hearing from you and hope you'll join us again next week for another episode of On the Line. to make some room on your wish list. If you thought a 3D printer sounded good, how about this? Ta -da! A machine that prints solar panels. This is one of its creators. Uh, my name's Sean Frain. I write Inventor when I go through customs. <laughs> and Sean was kind enough to let me live this DIY dream by bringing a few pieces of his prototype to my backyard. Yeah, this is about, um, one half of a complete solar pocket factory. The other half didn't fit in the suitcase. That we smuggled over into New York City, direct from Hong Kong and Manila. That's where Sean's colleagues are based. They're self-identified independent inventors who team up to make stuff, sometimes financed by big companies, and sometimes, like with this project, bankrolled by strangers. We're launching this on Kickstarter, and as of this shooting, we're at about 70K. And this is meant to pay for some of the equipment required for a solar pocket factory. The aim is to have a full working model done by April. And then they have this other modest goal. Hopefully revolutionize how microsolar production happens in the world. Currently, many solar panels like... The 2-volt panels that go in your garden lights or the 5-volt panels that would power your iPhone... ...are made by hand in factories in China, India, and Bangladesh, Sprain says. Assembly line workers take laser-etched silicon cells. That's the stuff solar panels are made of. A bunch of people snap off little tiny pieces of the silicon and you combine them together. The problem is that labor prices are going up 
and the price of silicon has plummeted over the last couple years. So small panels end up being much more expensive per watt than large scale panels, Brain says. He says that automating the process could bring down the price. Enter the solar pocket factory. You would start by feeding sheets of silicon into this module. This one here replaces this step of snapping the laser scored cell into solettes. In the full prototype, the machine will catch the solettes and bring them to this module where they're attached to a backing. This device does the placement and the interconnection of the solettes. The solettes are pushed up. Each piece of silicon outputs around half of a volt. Light comes in, a photon dislodges a, an electron um, that hops to the other side of the solar cell. And then there's enough that jump over to the other side that there builds up almost um, uh, an electrical pressure and voltage. And voila, you have electricity. And it turns out that you can take a bunch of these little solettes and wire them up in series to get the micro power output you want. The bottom of the solettes are positive. The top of the solettes are negative. We need to connect the bottom of one solette to the top of a neighboring solette. So we're going positive to negative, just like you would four batteries to get, you know, five volts. So far, super gluing the solettes in a shingle pattern seems to work. In the full model, the panel will get a protective coating, will be baked in an oven, and then a testing device will make sure the panels work. And then they'll be ready to go. The goal um, in April is that we can do one placement per second. It means a machine can do between 300,000 to a million panels per year, depending on the mix of voltage. Although the solar pocket factory fit in my backyard, the model is more like... The microbreweries. Um, they're not things that people necessarily have in their homes, but they're down the street and in their neighborhoods. And the idea is that if people can get microsolar panels more easily, Brayden says, maybe more inventors will use them. It's a supply drives demand kind of argument. Solar pocket factories combined with uh, maker bots, combined with shop bots, we think could um, maybe push more and more solar products out into the world. This is speculation. <laughs> <laughs>
Kambar dukti, pansa gurgu dukti. A lot of women experience heavy bleeding, tiredness, and you cannot sustain, you cannot do work. She and others welcome efforts to fortify staple crops. In the case of pearl millet or bajra, the grain is made into a flatbread or roti, which is eaten every day by families in Maharashtra. The biofortified millet can provide 30 percent of the mean daily iron requirement of women and children. Farmer Dinesh Pukhar.